uh, Emma and I have uh, uh, got a really interesting lineup of really new Aussie whiskies, uh, some of which pretty much went before we sent them out, hadn't even hit the market yet. We just got these blank bottles with uh, you know, just covered in marker pen to tell us what it was. Uh, and uh, yeah. there we go. just do wait for another minute and then we'll get going. Hey, David, I'm going to give Rod a quick call to see if he's um, tagging along tonight. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've got a critical mass. So uh, those of you who haven't uh, met me before, I'm uh, David, mainly look after the uh, uh, the whiskey shows and uh, virtual events. And uh, Emma down in, in Melbourne is the uh, uh, our rock star bar cocktail guru. And uh, so a few people just joining. And uh, we've got five fantastic new Aussie malts, plus one mystery one, which we'll do at the end. And uh, that's a bit of fun. What we'll do is we'll go through them all. We'll taste them. We'll get you to guess. And you get, the person who gets it right, first person to get it right, will actually win a bottle of something. We like giving stuff away to people who, who deserve it. And... Uh, uh, but again, a bit of fun. We're going to get you to, to rate them before we tell you what it is. Kind of trust your palate. Don't be influenced by where whiskey's from, who made it. If you like it, you simply like it for what it is. If you don't like it, exactly the same. doesn't matter how many awards it's won. Uh, it's just how you feel. That's what, that's what, what we like. Uh, so, so small group, any questions, comments? We like to keep these interactive. Um, you tell us what you think of these whiskies. And the uh, first one we'll start off is uh, the, um, let's go with the iniquity. Mm -hmm. Iniquity rum cask. It's a whiskey list exclusive, part of the anomaly series. Is that uh, 47 odd percent? Now, the Iniquity Distillery, Tin Shed Distillery, they make rum as well. And part of the, uh, the Requiem series. And named Requiem because uh, Jens Schmidt, being an ex-Navy guy, names his rums after shipwrecks. So this one, single malt in the rum cask, was actually matured in one of his own rum casks. So once we... Uh, Explore this a bit more. I'll tell you the story of that really interesting ship trip because they are fascinating stories. And I think they are. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. This is the first time I've tried it as well. I didn't get the chance to try it at the show. It's, um, we got sent a whole lot of samples earlier, ooh, probably even end of last year. And um, this one certainly was the standout we thought it was. Certainly got that, uh, that typical you know, rum, that overripe banana, pineapple. Quite dry on the finish, though. Mm. But, but very gentle. Can become quite a quaffable whiskey, I think. Mm. It's good to see more rum casks here in Australia because obviously, like, when you think of Australian alcohol, Bundaberg and stuff is the kind of the first that comes to mind, whether for good or bad. But um, yeah, it's nice to see Ian Schmidt loves his rum. So of course, he's got to put a bit of that in. So, so far, it's released three rums. The first one was the SS Ferret, uh, which is a hysterical story, but we won't get into that. That's a rabbit hole we'll leave for another time. Um, the second one that the cask was used for this this whiskey is the um, uh, the Songvar SV Songvar, which is a uh, uh, obviously a, a Scandinavian uh, a ship. 
that that sank in uh, off the coast of uh, South Australia because it got um, sp its hull got spiked by its own anchor. Now, how does one do that? It's almost like how do you put your own elbow in your ear? Well, th they were offloading or loading uh, bags of, of wheat, grain, uh, 40,000 bags, or, and they had to do it by hand. And uh, the crew obviously got thirsty. They all disappeared to the pub, left a skeleton crew on board, um, and they had you know, the, the, the two anchors. And um, <laughs> yes, both yes, can trip over there on two feet. Um, and uh, the, uh, I can't remember either the skeleton crew also decided to join their mates in the pub. I think that's what happened. Um, and it, the tide went out and the boat was very heavy with uh, all the bags of grain and uh, it settled on its own anchor and ruptured the hull and there it sat. And it's um, now used as a, a, a diving wreck. It's an artificial reef. It's, it's completely shredded. It's, it's hardly, re re uh, you can hardly recognize it as a ship. It's just bits and pieces. But that is the uh, the sad tale. It's um, you know, uh, didn't go down in a blaze of glory. Didn't get sunk in war. Um, but that's uh, that's really the uh, uh, SV Songva story. And what happened to the crew? Where they lost their jobs? Uh, well, they didn't have a ship to sail in. But uh, yeah. So any thoughts on the uh, the rum rum cask from iniquity compared with other? Um, from cast matured whiskies, Australian ones or otherwise. I'm afraid of that tasting notes in the chat as well. I love reading them. They're my favorite. Yes. It's pulled a lot of influence from the cask, the whiskey. Uh, it's very rummy. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a bottle of the rum itself. I'd love to taste them side by side, just to do a bit of a, a comparison to see how much of the DNA is there. Mm. What I do like about it, though, is it seems like the kind that the more you drink of it, the more enjoyable it becomes. It doesn't feel like it's uncomfortable to drink after a while. Yeah, And, and that's, that's what we found is that, as I said, it is quite gentle. Yeah, I like Andrea's. It's a bit darker on the palate than most rum casks. You usually don't get plum notes. I agree. It's rum casks can either go like hyper fruity or like hyper molasses bitter. So this is that nice kind of like balance. I don't really like rum, so <laughs> the fact that I like it's probably a good indication. And I wasn't a, a rum drinker at all until I started doing uh, you know, virtual rum tastings and. Uh, uh, the, certainly the, the Caribbean dark rums have grown on me and I have polished off a bottle of uh, Ian's uh, ferret. Mm. I'm with Andreas, so spiced rum or even rum that's not technically rum. I enjoy my Sailor Jerry in an espresso martini because vodka is just a waste of alcohol. You've got to go Sailor Jerry. You can't go anything nicer or anything worse. <laughs> but yeah. There's like really high quality rums, the Coronis, you know, the four square rum. It's one of my absolute favorites. Uh, they're just hard to beat. They've got their own little, you know, subculture of rum fans. Uh, that's uh, obviously uh, still some of it left uh, on the Whiskey List website. It's uh, uh, a stupidly reasonable price at $129 for a 700 ml bottle. Um, I don't know how they got to that, but uh, therefore, it's, um, yeah. All right, going to crack on to the Amber Lane. Amber Lane. Unless everyone's yeah. still enjoying the iniquity. I'm <laughs> down to still enjoy it. This is, you can always revisit them. Look, you've got 20 mils. You only need half of that to get a feel for it. You can always come back to them, uh, revisit them afterwards uh drink them all now we don't judge <laughs> at all uh, amber lane this was the uh, the distillery situated in the central coast new south wales central coast that uh, uh literally got uh, launched to the public pretty much a week ago um and uh um luckily we have the guy that made it rod berry 
is around. Rod, you here? Oh, there you are. I uh, can't hear you yet, Rod. You can... uh, yep, can you hear me now? Yes. Rod, um, Hi, everyone. Sorry. Nice to meet you all. Um, so, yeah, we launched about a week ago, as David has said, and this is our first expression to the market. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm a big fan of sherry cask whiskey, but I also in recent time have fallen in love with bourbon casks. So this is a merger of the two. We've uh, brought together two different types of sherry casks, Pedro Zimenez and Australian Apera, and we've brought that together with a bourbon cask from Heaven Hill Distillery. And uh, it's about 60% sherry cask, sorry, 60% bourbon cask, 40% sherry cask, and it really brings together what we think are the best flavours from both um, origins. Um, and that's really what our distillery is about, is playing with and exploring that interaction between sherry and bourbon cask. One thing that I learned when I started distilling was we ordered a virgin cask from Kentucky from uh, the cooperage that supplies Heaven Hill. And we compared the weight of a virgin cask with a cask that's held bourbon. A virgin cask weighs about 40 kilos and a cask that's held bourbon about 50 to 55 kilos. And what that means is that you're getting about 10 to 15 kilos of bourbon goodness available to extract uh, and to join with your own new make to create this lovely flavour. The sherry casks we use, the, the Pedro Zimenez cask comes from Fernando de Castilla. Uh, it's a 30 year cask. And so there's just so much goodness there. So I'd be very interested to, to hear what people think about that combination. And they're all full size, 200, 250 litre casks? Yeah, that's right. So the, the sherry casks are 250 litres and the bourbon casks are 200 litres. So one of the things about uh, maturing whiskey in Australia is as you, as you move further north, uh, temperature dictates you really need larger casks. Um, it, it's um, very common in Tasmania, for example, to have smaller barrels, um, but, but we find that we need the larger casks that allows us to age the spirit a bit longer. So we started in 2018, our casks, our oldest casks are about four years old now. So this is the result of that aging process. And at 50%, uh, it's good to see that uh, that decent whack of, of ABV pushes the flavors through. Absolutely. So, so this is the bottle. And uh, David, I think you've still got some available online because it's our first expression ever. You also get, if you place an order, what we're calling our Wonka ticket, uh, our golden ticket, which is really just our thank you to you for supporting us. Obviously, when we start from scratch, we need all of the, the love and support that we can get. Um, so if you enjoy the, the, the drown tonight, please support us. And also, if you want to get online and have a look at us on Instagram, just look at Amber Lane Distillery, uh, Facebook as well, where you can find our website. But please do support the Whiskey List and order, place an order through the whiskey list if you'd like a bottle of this. It's one, 179 uh, at the moment. Um, it's, it's, it's first time we tried this, somebody else mentioned fairy floss. It's, uh... mm. it's got those, like, you know, when you buy those muesli bars that have like all the different fruits and coconut and raspberry and stuff like that, because you're like, I'm going to be healthy. And you realize that there's like way more sugar in it than you realized. It smells like that, <laughs> you know, those... There's like really sugary, fruity, tropical kind of vibes. That's really cool. And and definitely that 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 balance, that sherry, just that uh, uh, just the, the touch of the PX and just turbocharges that bourbon cask. Yeah. And uh, and we always we love to see, especially new distilleries uh, with bourbon cask releases because that that showcases the spirits. It's a brave move. You can't hide. Um, some of you might have heard my uh, uh, Warren Buffett example. He uses this analogy in relation to the share market. I use it for whiskeys that it's only when the tide goes out, you realize who's been swimming without their shorts. <laughs> you can't hide your, your, your spirit uh, uh, in a bourbon cask. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's such a great um, cask style, especially for Australian distillers because it really is the mark of a great spirit is it holds up in a bourbon cask 
but also obviously for you guys, it's a little bit more affordable to get your hands on than cherry casks. So. Yeah, that's Just right. It's about <laughs> it's about uh, five hundred dollars for a, a two hundred liter bourbon cask, and the sherry casks are a little bit south of two thousand dollars each. So it's definitely a lot cheaper. But with the shipping issues at the moment, it's actually hard to get bourbon casks into Australia. So we've had to place an order for one hundred and thirty of them, which will arrive around December this year. Um, it's going to take that long to get them. We've got uh, forty eight sherry casks coming from Spain in June. And then we have to wait till Christmas to get um, the bourbons. So they're, they're quite rare at the moment. Yeah. Andrew, up, up, up coconut for me as well. Yeah, the coconut is strong, Andrew. I, I completely, there is definitely that coconut vibe. Uh, those like dried coconuts that you, yeah, for baking. Mm. Excellent. Well, uh, uh, thanks for joining us, Rod. It's, uh, That's my pleasure. The, the guys who make this stuff. We always say that you know, the um, um, you know, be honest about the whiskeys because we don't make them ourselves. Well, tonight you can still be honest, but yeah, Rod made this whiskey himself. <laughs> uh, and now for something completely different, uh, we'll head off to South Australia to another new distillery, the third one, which is the Cut Hill. The Cut Hill Mead Cask. Now, I have to admit, I, I don't think I've ever drunk mead, so I've got no, uh, no basis for comparison. But certainly it's, uh, it's, it's honeycomb. It's, uh, what's the ABV on this, 48%? Yeah. So this, this cask comes from, because obviously there's a South Australia distillery, um, the barrel comes from Maxwell's Winery, which they make table wines and stuff like that. Um, they're based in McLaren Vale but they're predominantly known for their mead. They do like a spiced mead and a spicy mead and then a regular mead and then like an organic mead or whatnot. Um, and they're probably the one you're most familiar with. I think you can find it a lot of um, bottle shops. There are smaller mead producers, but it's like such a niche thing that you don't really find too many casks lying around. So this is pretty different. Well, certainly it's got the spiciness on, on, on the end of it. Mm. This, uh, I'd be curious what this would be like over vanilla ice cream. That sounds dangerous <laughs> in the best way possible. So that one's at, at 195. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 the kind of thing that you just knows all day. I don't even have to drink it. Mm. Yeah. But, um, but it's almost that that spiciness. It's almost like like glue vine. Cinnamon. Yeah, like American Big Red chewing gum sort of spiciness. Mm. Yeah. I I think it would be really cool actually to do like a parallel tasting side by side of this whiskey with. Maxwell's wheat, uh, mead. Weed. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, yes. <laughs> that my brain is gone. Please excuse me. I literally have COVID right now and my brain is just all over the place. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I think that would be really cool. But if there's, there's one other mead producer I remembered in South Australia, they're called Chateau Dorian. It's the tackiest looking building you've ever seen in your life. It's like if you blew up a, um, a mini golf course, castle but like made it human sized um and they make some really cool spiced meads and they make uh, like blackberry meads and stuff like that but it would be really cool to do like this whiskey paired with the the mead that it, the cask is from as well i think it would be cool i'm just saying drink more mead you know <laughs> have more interesting casks available <laughs> uh, Anthony, yeah. uh, now that you said it i can't get past the cola me either. <laughs> the cola nut. Yeah. Cola gummies, yeah, sure. Hmm. It's not, uh, you, you, you think mead and you think honey. It's actually not as sweet as, as I would have expected it to be. No, it's really interesting because obviously, like, mead is one of the oldest forms of alcohol in existence. Um, 
you know, it was being made in the early um, uh, Aztec eras with um, spit, essentially, uh, there would be women who would eat honey, swirl it around, spit it out, and then do that over and over and over again to make me because the, the bacteria, well, not bacteria, but the chemicals in saliva would ferment it. Um, so obviously that's not how we make meat nowadays. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it is the, like when you take something as sweet as honey and you ferment it in that way, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, it's definitely, Tom, this, this one is not, uh, this is not like that vodka where it was like every drop is poured over an inappropriate object. <laughs> No, this one is made using traditional yeast and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Great call, Judith. Like American root beer, like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like Dr Pepper, um, and oh, and like sarsaparilla stuff as well. Mm. Yeah, good call. Oh. Um. Well, so we've had a, a rum cask, a mix of bourbon, a pera, and PX casks, mead cask, uh, and now we've got from Tassie the Hobart cognac cask. But this is a, a cognac cask finish with a Hobart, uh, certainly got a soft spot for that distillery and uh, um, John Jarvis, one of the nicest guys in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. If you haven't been down to Tassie and met John Jarvis, you're missing out. He's like um, one of those people who's like quite, you know, big and, you know, big built, muscular, and he's just a teddy bear on the inside. And those are my favorite kind of people because they're just absolutely the sweetest. Um, and he's such a hoot. Uh, he keeps harassing me when when you take it bring your husband to meet me like I don't care about you <laughs> when can I meet your husband <laughs> so it's such a sweetheart yes go on Dave <laughs> his, his hobby is making knives so don't let that put you off <laughs> he doesn't wear them all about his person but uh, yeah it's a, a great little sideline um, using the, uh, um, uh, the metal band the hoops of casks uh, to forge them into into blades because why not? So cognac cask, again, quite brave. Um, not an easy, easy cask to work with. Not that many people do it. Um, do you know how long it's been in the cognac cask? You know, after bourbon? I think it's a year at least in the cognac cask. I can't remember quite how long, but I do remember it was for a significant period. And it's always tricky because cognac casks tend to be um, ex-French oak. And French oak is quite drying, um, so it, it's kind of tough to really keep the sweetness of the cognac, but balance it off against the dryness of the French oak. Um, so I think it was around a year or so um, that it was finished for. They typically don't do like super short finishes at Hobart. Um, from all the other expressions, that, strong, that John's created, it's usually, you know, at least a year uh, minimum because they, they want to get as much flavor out of it as possible. Um, yeah, they they do some weird, cool, kooky casking at, uh, at Hobart Whiskey. I've got a bottle of their maple rum cask, a, a rum barrel that held maple syrup in it and then held whiskey in it. Um, it tastes like pancakes. And it's my favorite, <laughs> but I think he's doing something else special for Winter Feast this year. He said, but not he's quite. always got something weird on the go. Um, uh, but certainly uh, at the whiskey show in Hobart this last weekend, uh, where we weren't short of obviously Tasmanian distilleries, um, Hobart was uh, certainly one of the standouts and one of the best sellers of quite a few of their releases. Um, but yeah, from that. At French Oak, you do get that that dry finish, the tannins on the end. Mm. Yeah, but it's also got this like beautiful 
like a grape must, but like floral, you know, musket grapes kind of thing. You know, the ones on the cheese board that are always too dry, so you never really want to eat them, but like the juiciness on the inside is worth it. So we've you know, four different cast types and styles. Uh, um, in fact, no, three different states. We've got South Australia <laughs> represented twice. I'll look carefully. Um, any any standouts? Any favourites so far? Rod's on mute, so he can't hear you. So you can be honest. <laughs> I found the mead quite enjoyable, actually. It was very reminiscent of mead. Um, but like the sharpness at the end definitely reminded you that this is not mead. <laughs> um, but it was it was very nice. Yeah. So it's like, I'm still highly alcoholic. <laughs> Don't forget. Yeah. Right. Um, For me, I think the rum cask has been my favourite so far. I mean, they've all been good, but yeah. that was just exceptional. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm surprised by the rum cask as well because I'm not a big rum person. I see Michael's asked what the initial maturation for the cognac cask was, so it spent its life in bourbon. Yeah, expert. That that's the house style of of Hobart. Yeah. Pretty much, that's uh, they also that in in bourbon casks. Yeah. So it's it's what they predominantly do. They use mostly 200 liter casks. Is I believe it's been a few years since I've been there um but yeah the the thing that honestly stands out to me about Hobart whiskey the most is the guy who owns the place his name's Rocky and he doesn't live in Tassie he just writes some blank checks and says make good whiskey and that's really all John has to go off of and they've created a great you know little crew and they they have their like cool experimentation side but then they also do you know core styles you know predominantly bourbons they've got their signature uh, and stuff like that so it's 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 good to see how um how they're going and John told me a story years ago about I think they were about four years into distilling and whatnot and I was down there with whiskey and ailment and they were like uh so um we've never been to another distillery we're like what do you mean and they're like we've never visited another distillery Sullivan's Cove is around the corner but we've never like had the time to go see another distillery so we don't know what they're doing and we're like don't ever <laughs> if this is what you're doing you know on your own volition and and stuff like that I think you'll be he's he's visited other distilleries since but it I thought it was really cool that they were able to accidentally insulate themselves from the Tasmanian whiskey scene while also obviously being a part of it um, and still create, you know, just a, an iconic core spirit, which is pretty cool. But if you, uh, if you do visit them, uh, they've got this great upstairs uh, mezzanine uh, bar and tasting table. Um, make sure it's your last thing you do on a day and don't make any plans after that. Mm -hmm. uh, just saying, anyway. John has a bad habit of just, he's like, let's try this barrel and let's try this barrel and let's try this barrel. And it's like, oh my God, I'm not driving home. <laughs> I'm talking about not driving home. I hope none of you are. Uh, um, we've got some few heavy hitters. I think the, the lowest ABV we've had so far is 47 with the first rum cask up to 50. Um, and uh, when, when we kind of set this lineup, we kind of realized that they all are unique, different, and uh, um, uh, quite contrast no no two are exactly the same except that number five is another rum cask uh at 52 percent 52 yep 52 percent from archie rose the the high test molasses rum cask matured whiskey which is a bit of a mouthful and a lot to stick on a little label if you're trying but uh it's it's matured in their own rum a cask from their own rum which was the high test molasses rum, which uh, in fact is uh, is that bottle um, at seventy two point seven percent. Who's who's had that rum? Who's had the Archie Rose high test molasses rum? Anybody? I couldn't resist it, and uh, uh, so starting kind of uh, uh, 
exploring different rums for, for events, etc. And I saw 72.7%, got to give it a go. Uh, and now I've got the opportunity of trying that the rum itself against the rum cask uh, matured whiskey. And uh, um, this one is, uh, it's all sold out. It's uh, um, didn't last very long. And what is high test molasses apparently? Um, for those of you who understand rum, I certainly don't. Um, it's um, the, uh, uh, the, the molasses that's expressed before the first um, part of the, the sugar is removed during the extraction process. So it's apparently it's got more of an elegant style than say the backstrap um, molasses. Um, but uh, trying the two, two side by side, now unmistakable similarities apart from the ABV. Mm. It's so interesting as well to see, because obviously um, <clears throat> when you talk about rum, there's actually two like, or multiple different types, because you've got like rum and then you've got rum agricole, uh, and then you've got different styles are produced based off of molasses versus um, the sugarcane liquid. So like the quality of, or, you know, what liquid you're getting out of the sugar cane makes a difference in the final product rum. So it's really fascinating to sort of see, and it would be really interesting to see how Archie Rose has made their rum versus how um, Ian Schmidt at Iniquity has made his rum. And if they're using kind of, you know, is Ian using molasses? Is he using sugar cane spirit, like base and stuff like that? So be really interesting to see because obviously I don't know if anyone else has noticed but for me on the nose they smell very different <laughs> completely different and <laughs> now this I'm getting a lot more you know, mocha coffee. getting like bootstrap leather yeah it's 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 kind of you know one of those gentlemen's club things yeah and like those like hazelnut Italian biscotti but you like left it in the oven too long it's like very yeah hmm hmm owen's called it that he prefers the iniquity over the archie rose just trying this right as well hmm. a few dashes of water which i haven't done for any of the others uh, they haven't needed it but hmm. Get a lot more leather yeah, it is very like, um, you know, when you get chocolate rust. So if you like leave a block of chocolate out and then it starts to go white a little bit, and that's just because yeah. it's been interacting with the moisture, we call it chocolate rust. You leave chocolate out? <laughs> Who leaves chocolate out? Anybody? Uh it happens sometimes Ooh, i bake yeah. a lot and like sometimes i don't even know i've got a block of chocolate sitting in the back of the baking goods cupboard like anyway it's a whole production line okay <laughs> in my house but yeah so like that that white stuff it's totally fine it's just moisture gotten into the chocolate but it it does like it can change the flavor and give it a more like waxy kind of characteristic i'm getting that off of it which sounds bonkers but you know Iniquity, so. if you're comparing the two, iniquity is a lot sweeter. Mm. More of that, that, that typical rum, rum notes. This one is uh, um, a lot heavier. Mm. You know, I, I think there is an unmistakable um, Archie DNA, especially comparing to the rum itself. Uh, you don't get that just on the rum. Mm. I will say that it's it's a cool concept to still be able to taste that it's an Archie Rose whiskey, um, even though it's in a completely different cask to a lot of what they use and stuff. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's a trait you see with Scottish distilleries. So I enjoy that we're able to apply that similar kind of picking up of, of flavors with Aussie distilleries too. Has anybody bought a bottle of this and not opened it just in case? And this is the first time they're trying it and either happy they did 
Okay, Mar <laughs> Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be the only one, but yeah. So, Marco, are you happy you haven't opened it yet, or? Um... Uh, no, I'm actually I'm going to be a bit of a heretic here. Everyone seems to prefer the iniquity, but I like the um, the darker, really chewy character of the Archie Rose. That's really speaking to me. So I'm going to savor that one when I do open it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's a great thing. Is like it's the same style of cask, but it's two completely different whiskies and different flavor profiles. So like, you know, I always say people. Are, like I don't normally like rum casks, but I'm like, I'll always try it because you never know what kind of flavor it's going to produce. Mm. And it's great that these, uh, the guys like uh, both Iniquity Archie, they're using the, the, uh, um, the casks, uh, no, their own casks. Mm. They've got that, then they, they can, they can manage it themselves. And uh, it's, uh, you know, they've got that DNA running through the whole process. And seeing the evolution of their uh, um, of, the, of their product, and uh, you know, great reuse of the resources, and um, yeah, at least we get to try it. Mm. And if you look at, at all of these whiskies so far, um, even when this one was available, it was selling for one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, that um, uh, they're all all under two hundred dollar bottles. Um, some mostly well under two hundred dollars. Um, which is good to see, and most of them in the 700 ml formats. Um, and that's what's happening, is that uh, uh, there is pressure with so many new distilleries coming on board, with uh, some of them with, with decent volumes, and they are putting pressure on, on the local industry, and, uh, and the guys are having to follow, and that's, uh, they're all hitting that sweet spot, uh, which, is, which is fantastic to see. Mm. I think as, uh, as well, we've seen a lot of distilleries come into the market with kind of, I mean, lower is not necessarily like, when I say lower, I mean like below 55%. I'm used to, you know, a lot of single cask Australian whiskeys where they're like, yeah, we bottled this at 62% ABV. And it's like, how, why? I mean, sure. But like, you probably only got 10 bottles and, and you could have, you know, stretched that out and I'm watering it down anyway. And I think it's really great to see so many distilleries and like Rod, I think 50% is such a great ABV to have it at because you've got that strength, you've got that viscosity, but you're also, you know, not like completely closing off an entire market of people who are like, that's way too high an ABV content for me. Like I'm going to burn my face off, which I've had like, you know, I've had some whiskeys where I'm just like, why? Oh, we want you to, you know, water it down to how you want and I understand that but at the same time like I just want to be able to pour it into my glass and know that it's going to be good because I have to have you know you have to have faith in the distiller that they know what their whiskey is best at and you know sometimes things could be a bit higher ABV you know you don't mind it but it's great to see so many distilleries getting in on that you know 50 percent to kind of 46 percent ABV range where they're getting more bottles they're getting a better price point and it's accessible for more consumers, I think as well. There's Emma, my rant, rant for think, the day. I was going to say that um, as a distiller myself, I, my intention is to release whiskey as I would like it myself. So mm. make whiskey that you love yourself and try and carry that passion with the people who follow and, and try your whiskey. So um, our next two releases, one will be at 48%, another at 49%. So one will be a sherry cask only and the other will be a bourbon only. Uh, and they are the strength that I think they taste best at. So that's what we'll release them at. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that, you know, it's coming from the bar industry, you know, that a lot of people, and there, there are whiskeys that taste great, at higher ABVs. One of my favorites is from Scotland and it was 64.2% ABV and it was delicious. But, you know, having, you know, a bottle like every single release is in that 60% ABV is, is you know, I, I think it's, it's fine, but, you know, you really got to cater to what the whiskey drinks best at. And some of these drams would be just so good at this, like much more approachable ABV. Um, 
and and even some people are, are like you know you look at Morris and there I think there's 46 percent is kind of their standard and it's just approachable and it's great you know there's there's nothing wrong with a Glenfiddich 12 year old you know <laughs> like, there's nothing wrong with that just quaffable dram so it's it's great to see so many of the, these whiskeys that we're trying tonight are not the big gangbusters cask strength single casks out of a 20 liter barrel that you know blows your face off and costs 300 dollars a bottle <laughs> yeah just comparing uh, um sorry adrian that's a uh, kind of got uh, diverted the um, um the, the actual the rum versus the rum cask whiskey and the the rum is actually closer to the iniquity than the Archie Rose whiskey is. Uh, you don't get any of that, uh, that, that chocolate malt isn't coming through. So you don't have that, that, that leather, uh, the rum ball things. It's more, more typical, you know, right? so it's, it's a lot sweeter. I've, I've just added a bit of water to bring it down to a similar ABV. And um, uh, yeah, it would, wouldn't say that they uh, actually, uh, uh, you get that, that, that similar rum style, but, um, a lot more complexity in the whiskey, to be honest. Um, and uh, Andreas, even though you, you did, didn't like it uh, compared with the others, um, great notes and great comparisons. So thank you for, for that, those insights. Um, so, uh, I, I think if, if you're a rum fan, you'll enjoy the Archie Bros, but I'm just not a big fan of rum. and it's heavy rum notes like as soon as i tasted it it was just chocolate rum balls which my mum would love this whiskey <laughs> so if you're a rum fan you'll like it <laughs> clearly kid doesn't like it either <laughs> no i'm i yeah, preach i'm 100 percent. yeah i'm 100 percent with you i'm not a big rum fan so i definitely go the iniquity but for people who live and breathe and you know are obsessed with rum this this Archie Rose is up their alley. Okay, uh, mystery one. Um, and that's a, it's a good segue in that the uh, Archie Rose is a good kind of palate cleanser. Um, so let's see what you guys think of uh, this one. All we know is that it's... Um, um, Australian. <laughs> it's Australian, yes, yes, yes. Ooh. <laughs> You secretly put a Scottish one, is it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and that would be terrible. Imagine we had we did that because we were like, no, we don't want to give. <laughs> no, absolutely, uh, it is Australian for sure. So I'll tell you, it, the ABV is under fifty percent. You have to guess. Firstly, the state. Let, let's keep it simple. Let's pick the state. Not too many to choose from, and then the distillery, and. Uh, and then if you brave the cask type or the other way around. Yeah, Tom, if you want to win a bottle, you have to guess the what it is, essentially the brand and, and, and the type and whatnot. And I'll, I'll let you all know when I see it in the chat. So you can keep going. <laughs> in any particular, yeah, uh, Citrusy, actually. First time I'm tasting this one. Mm. Well, firstly, do people like it? Do you not like it? Again, trusting your palates. And you've got completely blank piece of paper. We've got a huge range of states, locations, distilleries. I know, we made it tough. There's what? I was doing the research the other day. There's 300 or so distilleries in Australia, and 72 of them are making whiskey, with about 30 or so other gin distilleries about to start making whiskey as well. So and there's I, definitely a <laughs> few. At our first whiskey show in 2012 in Sydney, there were a dozen 
Australian distilleries with whiskey in the market. That was 2012. 10, 11 years later, we've got 80 or so, just under 80. Well, Kyle's happy, at least it's drinkable, but then it doesn't matter what distillery it is. Oh, oh, oh. David, are you going to run the poll maybe first? Yeah, so once people have had a shot at it, we're going to run the poll. Um, so you get to even rate this one without knowing what it is. Oh. And then we'll tell you. You need me to mm -hmm. set up the poll. There well, you go. Well, it's, it's, uh, yeah, mine swore at me because it said I don't have a, a current version. Zoom updates? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I just turn it on and rock up because there's whiskey. <laughs> okay, so so kind of neck and neck between uh, Amber Lane and and Hobart. Guessing the mystery dram. Sorry, voting for the mystery dram doesn't increase your chances of winning. <laughs> <laughs> I do think I do think there's been a correct guess. I just have to confirm. Yep, yes. So, so there's, somebody's got it. Somebody got it spot on. Um, mm. I'm not saying who yet. But I have written it down because I'm don't. Do we at least vote for who we think got it right? I mean, that's that's <laughs> going to be worth <laughs> half a point, right? Well, then, then you get to share the bottle. <laughs> I'm going with Tom, so. Uh, okay, has everybody voted? Mm. Got a few people left yet to vote. Yeah, yeah. Come on, guys. Commit yourselves. All right. Well, how's everyone? Is everyone? No, yes. No. This is so confusing. It's like the percentage participated, but 100% of the people participating who answered it answered it. Because admins can't vote. So you can end it now. Ah, that it's explains done. it then. Damn yeah. it. I mean, to be fair, I probably would have voted for, for the winner from tonight as well. It is absolutely one of my favorites. So narrow lead on the Hobart Cognac cask. It's a good spread, which is good to see. So different, different mm. styles and everything got at least, at least one vote. So uh, yeah, brilliant. Congrats yeah. to Rod. Uh, he was the favorite at our in-person tasting and looks like second favorite tonight. Um, yeah. Tied as well, but for a for first whiskey out the door, mate, congrats. Uh, Thank popular. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, a, it's very encouraging. We need lots of encouragement. There's a lot of work that goes into it and it's nice that people are enjoying the results. Yeah, it's great to see. I, I missed it at the beginning um, when you were talking, Rod, sorry, in between two tastings. Um, but if we have some of your certificates left over, so anyone who buys a bottle tonight gets a certificate as well. I think there's five or six bottles and certificates left over. So if you want that first release certificate, um, yeah, hit up the link. So uh, some, some very specific guesses. Um... Spirit Thief, American Oak Shiraz casks, the Timboon, Tom Surrender, etc. Um, but the first person, there were a few that got uh, that kind of got it, but the first person to get it absolutely right was David Christie. Were you, David? Brilliant. Well done. <laughs> yeah, bang on. And I think it was your like your only guess as well, which is even yeah. more impressive. You just nailed it right on the head. So, oh, so you, have, you, have you had this before? Do you have a bottle? Uh, yes. Is my microphone working? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Just out in the garage. Yeah, we, we went through to went straight to Manly with their tasting when they did their release, but just had those bourbon bourbon notes through, and that was my my idea of a guess anyway. Well, it's not a bad idea of a guess considering <laughs> it was correct. <laughs>
So it's, yeah. got, it's great, great bottle. It's got the dimples, the sandstone stopper. Um, yep, and, and the uh, little coaster underneath. They've got the little the pack when they did the first release. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, forty six percent ABV. Yeah. And uh, so you get to choose now. Um, you get to choose either the um, uh, the iniquity or the Hobart. Um, so uh, well, I'm a good, big fan of John Jarvis, and we've actually got a bottle of whisk, a barrel down there with John, and we saw him a couple of weeks ago in Tassie. So I we'll have to go to Cognac Cast. Excellent. It's so good. He's yeah, so lovely. It. He drains my bank account every time he tells me about something new. It, it really yeah, is. Yeah, no, we, we, we're trying to get him to get the uh, the 45 mil virtual tastings back up again because they were good in the little test tubes. Yeah, I remember. And I know that. he's coming up for your Sydney show because we'll yep. come up from Albury. So we've got a few of us coming up. That's very exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I tragically couldn't go see him down in Hobart. For obvious COVID reasons, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing him in uh, in Sydney as well. Tragically, I don't think he'll be able to bring his knives with him to show me, but uh, <laughs> no, and he takes too long to make them, as he says. So eight it's weeks, an, eight weeks per knife. Well, yep. it would be shorter if he used the right metal. My husband makes knives as well, and he's like. What do you mean he's making them from the rung? <laughs> like that's the worst kind of metal you could be using. But um, yeah, but I think it's such a nifty idea. And it's it's great to, you know, reuse. And it's a great skill that people don't really have much anymore, you know? So. Yeah. Uh, we were fortunate enough to spend a, few, a weekend with them a few weeks ago. My brother and myself, I think a few people know my brother, Andrew Christie. So... We were down in Tassie for their first ever Tassie Whiskey Weekend up at Lake Pedder for three days. That was sensational. Yeah. yeah fantastic. Uh, and those yeah. of you who are coming to the uh, the Sydney show on 20th and 21st, World Whiskey Day, uh, we're right at the end of Sydney Whiskey Week, uh, you'll see the Hobart guys, um, you'll see the Manly guys, um, Archie Rose, um, Amber Lane, Rod will be Amber there. Amber Lane. Yep, we'll be there. Um and uh, uh, so pretty much most of the uh, uh, distilleries that uh, we tasted today will be joining us in Sydney and you can chat to the people that, that make the stuff, which is really exciting. Mm. Just, they, to, uh, just, just to add, um, John is launching his brand new core range at the Sydney Whiskey Show as well. He did a sneak peek at the Tassie one on Saturday. Uh, I'll let him have all the glory in his launch. It's delicious. Uh, he's been working on it a long time. It's, yeah, definitely come in to try it. Yeah, it'll be really exciting. And I think hopefully we're getting John for some of the other shows because I saw one person's coming to the Adelaide show, which is very exciting. I know for sure we're probably going to get Cut Hill uh, over at the Adelaide show and a few more fun guys. But, um, and then... Obviously, we've got the, uh, if you're a big fan of the smoke, big fan of Isla, got yeah. that coming up as well, which I'm so excited about, so insanely excited about. So, yeah, should be, uh, should be a great time for the next few months, seeing everyone and drinking whiskey everywhere. It's going to be great. One thing we've done with uh, both Tassie and South Australia is that in Hobart, we only had... Um, uh, Tasmania distilleries as Australian distilleries and in Adelaide we'll only have South Australian distilleries obviously uh, Scottish Irish American etc but in terms of the Australian distilleries in those states we're sticking with the local guys because we can't even fit them all in uh, they get to uh, really showcase their wares to to the local crowd um, people like buying local and uh, and meeting the, the people that make the stuff and um um, no, in, in Hobart, we thought, well, uh, surely they've been overexposed. They, they see them every, at, at every fair. At, at, they can just visit them anytime. But no, they, they really enjoyed uh, um, kind of that interaction with the, the local distilleries and they sold really well. So we're sure that the same thing will happen in Adelaide and obviously Sydney, a lot of the, the New South Wales distilleries and uh, um, more of them in, in Canberra as well. So it's, uh, um, each show is different. So if you are planning on combining your, your travels around Australia with the whiskey shows, 
uh, you're not going to see the same uh, brands represented at, at any two shows. So you can follow us around the country. From some of the Scottish ones, but yes. <laughs> There's always going to be new stuff on pour as soon as we can get our grubby little hands on it. So it'll be a lot of fun. Mm. Well, thanks everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, 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 so we didn't realize at the time how different each of these were going to be when we selected them. Um, but uh, hopefully there was something there that stood out. And uh, um, next time you're buying an Australian whiskey, it will be one of these. Mm. Awesome. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Rod, for, for being here, for popping in and giving the distiller's point of view. And yeah, everyone who came and uh, enjoyed, supported local, support Aussie. Yeah, that's what well, we do. While Rod is here, where is your distillery actually? So we're, we're currently on the central coast of New South Wales. Oh, cool. Uh, but we're looking to start warehousing some casks down near Huskisson on the south coast. We want to get our barrels closer to the coast and in a slightly cooler um, position. Uh, but yeah, central coast New South Wales at the moment. Cool. There you go. That's another New South Wales one's always nice. Like a thing in New South Wales, whiskey is one of the things that we generally miss out on because it's all down in Tassie. I don't know why my things decided to blow me. <laughs> it's good to have another Sydney one or New South Wales one. Yeah, just uh, if you want to come and visit us, um, you can just email me. You'll find our details on our website and very happy to, to welcome you. Generally, I'm distilling on a Friday yep. um, for the Spirit Run that's doing the second cut. So if you want to learn about how we do the cuts, very happy to show you the ropes. Yeah, that'd be really cool, actually. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, small Rob, humans. One last quick one. Uh, where can we get your contact details? Uh, just if you just look at Amber Lane Distillery, um, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and we've got a website, amberlanedistillery.com. One, one last one. Have you got RSS? Because it annoys me that websites don't have RSS anymore. Never mind. I think <laughs> Never it's mind. That, that it's answers my question. <laughs> it's a technical website right. term. <laughs> <laughs> I, I clocked those, those gamer headphones on you, Andrew. So. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think it's gone. Yeah. Over most yeah. people, including mine. <laughs> but yeah, awesome. Well, yeah, thank you, everyone. And David, do you have any Thank you, guys. Questions? And uh, yeah, we'll see you at the next, next event. There's uh, a coming thick and fast both the, the virtual shows of uh, interesting stuff and uh, and the live shows. Brilliant, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.